I think it's interesting to look at the different approaches that Angie and I have to photography, the different styles, and I don't think it could be better illustrated than to look, for instance, at the shot that she took in 2001, and in 2002 won her the wildlife, the overall uh, award in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. It's this wonderful shot of five elephants uh, in the Luangwa River in Zambia, um, standing there and watching this grey heron walk in front of them. Angie got a 500mm lens with a polarizer on a tripod and she sat there and she waited. And eventually one group of elephants came one after the other and then there was this one particular group and she just framed it beautifully and the reflection and the setting, there's not a blip in the background and it looks like a painting. Now if you compare that to the shot that I won the Wildlife Photographer of the Year with in 1987. My shot was a very graphic action shot. It was a, a wildebeest being grabbed by the nose by a wild dog. Funnily enough, both of us took our shots that won the overall uh, prize in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year with a 500mm lens. I was in my car following this pack of wild dogs. They set off after this wildebeest and uh, I knew that I would have literally seconds to get into position to be able to get that final shot because they'd very quickly pull the wildebeest to the ground and I wanted the moment while literally they were looking into each other's eyes. And the key to it was knowing what was going to happen and being in the right place before it happened to capture the moment, 60th of a second, 500 mil on a bean bag, forget image stabilization, pin sharp focus, and bingo, there you are. So I took this shot nearly 30 years ago now, but to me, rather like Angie's elephant shot, it's timeless. There's a sense of energy with the animals jumping into the river. There's separation, crucially, in the little, the young calf wildebeest, the front wildebeest, just stretching out to enter the river. There, it, it's not caught up in the body shape of the, the silhouette almost of the next wildebeest, so it's clean. So I took it with the zoom lens, 70 to 200, which was great because I could alter the composition. Um, it was fairly late in the evening. I took it at a 500th of a second, so it was probably 500th of a second, F8. I always carry, or we always carry with us a, a 15 mil, a fisheye lens, because particularly in places like Antarctica, where you've got the pack ice or where you can get up high on the ship and look down onto the front of the ship. Maybe you're going through stormy seas and, and, and you want to catch uh, the, the wave action and, and you don't want to use a thousandth of a second so it's all pin sharp. You actually want to get some blurred effect as the, the wave comes smashing up against the, uh, the prow of the ship. And uh, so I got up on the top of the ship and I, I leaned out. Um, I was actually up near the bridge and I just was out on one side uh, where there was a viewing platform and, and obviously got soaked once or twice but just captured this sense of the front of the ship. When you're taking a picture, you know, obviously you're taking it to some extent for yourself but also you've got to think with your commercial hat on. We had a classic situation where Angie and I were photographing uh, in Antarctica. We were on a Russian icebreaker and we, had, we came across, it was our first emperor penguin of that trip. And Angie captured this lovely um, vertical image, which was used by the Telegraph. And it just says, you know, here is man intruding in this hostile environment of the Antarctica. But she also took another picture, which was a horizontal picture, which included all the people who were, were just sort of all crawling around on the ice trying to get the shot of the emperor. And both of these shots had a lot of commercial potential. They would go in travel features, they would go in human interest stories. They had saleability. I've always tended to prefer to use for my primary setting shutter priority. As a wildlife photographer, speed to me has always been my primary concern. Let's say there's a, uh, a zebra running and I want to capture it pin sharp, thousandth of a second, very straightforward. But if you want to do what Angie did in this particular shot and then pan with the zebra and take it at a 60th of a second or 1 25th of a second, um, then you can get this beautiful creamy background and just parts of the zebra sharp and the legs blurred. Obviously though, I'm always looking into my viewfinder to check on the display. I want to see what aperture I'm taking as well. I want to be able to know what depth of field I'd be getting. So as if I've got some nasty sort of blob in the background and I want to throw it out of focus, then I can actually adjust my settings to reflect that. One of the things that really took my photography on a huge step was the whole idea about getting away from front light and trying to 
get the light coming towards you you know backlight or side light situations but of course the thing is if you're going to do that you have to understand what effect that will have on your exposure one of the things with the Canon cameras with their evaluative metering is is that in a side lit or backlit situation it'll probably give you a pretty good um, result because it's reading from a number of areas uh, on your image so it's going to take into account that it's got a large blob let's say for instance in a shot here of a lion roaring um, that might end up being underexposed if you were using a, you know a, a more center weighted um, setting but with evaluative metering it's going to read those highlight areas where lights coming in through the background through the grass and it's going to balance it out another thing that we often tend to do is to use the spot metering mode it can be very handy to take multiple readings off the lion, off the lioness, off the background and then just average it out. Also the tracking modes, the auto servo mode, if you've got a cheetah coming flat out towards you 70 miles an hour you're gonna to have to be really good. You'll have had to have put in years to actually track that in manual focus. But with predictive focusing, where it actually predicts where the animal is going to be when the shutter button is pressed, which auto servo gives you, then bingo, you know, you're in business. Another thing is to actually start to move your focus point around. Press that little button up by the right hand back side of the camera and uh, start moving the red dots around so as you can actually offset your subject in your composition uh, you can track things by actually customizing where you want the focus point to be. I love the fact that you can lock in your exposure, exposure lock, another little button just by your eye, press that in where the star button is and you can then make sure that you're going to have the subject that you're going to frame where you want it in the picture exposed the way you want it.